Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel where we talk about skincare, grooming, and sometimes hair, so that sounds like your thing. Make sure you are subscribed. Also, come and follow me on Instagram where I post a lot of stuff you're not gonna see here on YouTube. Today, I'm gonna be busting more myths with the help of science. There is so much misinformation here on YouTube and on the internet in general, there's a lot of fear mongering too. However, there is a wealth of correct information out there in the form of information from scientists, cosmetic chemists, science educators, biologists, and I want to bring those people and that correct information to the forefront. These are people who actually understand the clinical trials that we all try and quote. I recently asked you guys over on Instagram for some of your top skincare questions related to skincare myths. And my friend Cyril Laurent, I feel like I say that wrong every time, I'm so sorry. Cyril. He's gonna help me answer these questions. I subscribed to Cyril probably about a year ago now and I've learned so much from his channel. So please do go check his channel out after the video or now. You can go now if you want. But I'm gonna let him introduce himself. Bonjour, hello, my name is Cyril. So I would like to start first of all to thank you James for this amazing opportunity to be featured on your channel. So let me talk a little bit about me. So I used to be a stem cell researcher and therefore what I've always loved to do was to really read and go into details in all the scientific literatures behind the skincare ingredients. And my main interest about them is really to know how those ingredients are going to impact the biology of our uh, skin. One of the first myths that a lot of people still believe to this day and that I genuinely believed till probably about a year ago and put that information out there as factual information in one of my videos is that there's not really much of a difference between SPF 30 and SPF 50. I thought there was like one to 2% difference. And this is something I see in the comments a lot when people are like, can't I just use my SPF 15 makeup? It's not that much difference to SPF 50. I say no, and I'm um, a believer in using a separate sunscreen, not because SPF in makeup isn't effective, but for a different reason. But Cyril's gonna explain exactly why there is a difference between SPF 30 and 50. So the first myth, and this is definitely a myth that is very, very important in my book, is that an SPF 50 plus is very close to an SPF of 30 and therefore why bother using an SPF of 50 plus when you can just rely on the SPF of 30. So first thing first, an SPF of 50 plus corresponds to an SPF of uh, 60 or above. So what is very important is that the SPF is a test done in a laboratory condition under a UV light which is going to give you an idea of the level of protection against a sunburn. And we know that a sunburn is many triggers by UVB and a little bit of UVA also. And one of the big difference between an SPF of 50 plus versus an SPF of 30 is that the UV transmission that will goes into your skin is twofold. So you have two-fold less UV that goes into your skin with an SPF of 60 versus an SPF of 30. And this, just in terms of biology, is a huge, huge difference. Remember something is that the sunburn is an acute response to UV. So it is basically when all the cells are completely grilled that you have a sunburn, which doesn't mean that when you walk outside, you don't have damage from the sun. It is just that you cannot see it with your eyes. So there is a big difference between the two. Another major difference is simply the UVA protection, especially in Europe, but also in Australia, the UVA protection is indexed with the SPF, which translates into the higher the SPF is, the higher the UVA protection is, and it is a minimum of one third of the SPF. So basically with an SPF of 50 plus, so an SPF of 60, you will have a minimum of 20 in terms of UVA protection versus with an SPF of 30, you will only have a protection of 10. So a very low UVA protection, which is also why I always encourage you to choose an SPF 50 plus over an SPF of 30. One other big reason is simply the way that you are going to apply your sunscreen, because if you under apply an SPF of 60 or just the application is not even because you did it on a rush, for example, you will have a better protection for sure compared to an SPF of 30. In the end, of course, what is very important is to apply the correct quantity, which is 
two milligrams per centimeter square, which most of the time translate into one fourth of a teaspoon for the face. I've always talked about how much retinol has scared me. <laughs> I, I was so scared to use it before I really got into it. I'd always hear things like, be careful how much you use, it can dry you out, it can overly sensitize your skin. But the biggest like fear I had was that it was gonna thin out my skin. And this is something I read in a lot of comments on videos talking about retinol. Always commented on how using too much can thin out your skin. And that's one thing that really, really got me worried is I hate thin skin, the look of it. It looks like someone's taken like cling film, like plastic wrapped and tightened it around your skin. It's got that, like that fake shine to it rather than a glow. Is this true? Does retinol really thin out your skin? Another very popular myth is that if you use retinol, you are going to thin out your skin and basically that you are going to damage your skin. And this one is so, so wrong. And like most of the myths, it stems from a lack of understanding how things work. So retinol is a synonym for vitamin A. It naturally occurs in all our body. We have like a protein that takes the vitamin A from the food that we eat and that and this vitamin A will be transported in our blood using this protein that is a carrier, basically. And our skin cells are highly dependent on the retinol pathway. And the cells will have two choices when they use the retinol. They can either use it to stock it in a form of esters of retinol, or they can use it to power up what we call in biology the retinoic acid uh, pathway. So the retinol will be turned into retinol, also known as retinol de eye, and into retinoic acid, and you will have uh, all good stuff that will happen for your skin. What is very important with retinol, retinol, but also retinoic acid, is what we call the retinization process. So it means that during a month to almost six weeks, your skin needs time to tolerate it. And this is true that during this period, your skin can be more irritated. And this is because the very top surface of our skin that we name the skin barrier, also known as the stratum corneum, become thinner, but then it becomes healthier again. But the overall thickness of the epidermis increase when you are using retinol, but also retinaldehyde and tretinoin, and this is what you see over here. This is an old paper published in 1995, where you basically see that the thickness of the skin, even with a very low concentration of retinol, so here, roll, is increased very similar to RA, which is retinoic acid, also known as retinoic acid. So with retinol, don't worry, the retinol is actually going to make your skin thicker, just know that during four to six weeks, your skin may be irritating in this process because the very top surface of the skin will be thinner, but this is not a permanent state of the skin. Therefore, during this process, avoid any form of exfoliation. Just wait at least two months to see how your skin responds, and then slowly reintroduce uh, any exfoliants in the form of acid, for example. This is one that I get asked a lot and I never believed. <laughs> this is that, oh, go me, go for you. Um, this is that Vaseline and petroleum is toxic and is bad for you in the long run. I filmed a video like ages ago, like 10 ways to use Vaseline. Or... And to this day, I still get comments like, Vaseline makes your skin dark. You're putting petrol on your skin. It's gonna give you cancer. It's toxic. This is something I know isn't true, but I can never, when I get these comments, I can never explain why this isn't true. I just know it's not. So thankfully we have people like Cyril who can explain this for us. Another very, very common myth is that mineral oil and also vas Vaseline, which is basically petrol jelly, is very bad for the skin, especially that it is carcinogen. So mineral oil and also petrol jelly are all coming from crude oil. And basically crude oil is also a natural component because it is coming from algae, but also small plankton and plants basically that were trapped under the sea and compressed with a lot of pressure during a million years that have turned all this organic matter, so this biological material into um, crude oil. All, and from the crude oil, this is where we have, of, of course, um, all the gas, super uh, cars, and etc. And there is also byproduct that are uh, that are mineral oil and also petrol oil jelly. And when they are not refined, it is absolutely true that they contain uh, carcinogenic uh, substances. And I think back in the 70s or something like that, they were not uh, properly uh, refined and they were very, very 
problematic. However, now currently the cosmetic grade mineral oil and also the petroleum jelly are highly refined and devoid of all the those carcinogenic uh, molecules. You should also know that actually mineral oil is one of the best occlusives that we have to really trap in the water into your skin. And this is also very commonly used in uh, dermatological drugs because it is very inert on the top of our skin. So the cosmetic grade mineral oil and also petroleum jelly that we have are actually most often better than plants derived ingredients that might be irritating for your skin and especially they can trigger allergic response which is not the case of mineral oil and petroleum uh, jelly so don't be afraid of those ingredients. I get asked a lot of questions about acne and whilst I can only share my personal experience as a teenager with acne it's very, very different person to person. I feel like it's very personal as well, as far as what kind of acne you have and how it can be treated. And it really is something you need to go to a dermatologist to have diagnosed and treated, not a YouTuber. There is particularly this idea that there are two types of acne, in particular fungal acne being like the latest acne trend, if you will. So Cyril's going to explain what exactly fungal acne is, or what we believe to be fungal acne. And he's actually gonna see us out of this video, so I will see you soon, and I'll leave you with Cyril. Another very common myth is that there are two types of acne. So the one that we all know, the acne vulgaris, or the fungal acne, which is like the new one in the game. And it is as if now everybody has fungal acne, but this is not a proper term, this is not a form of acne. So what is exactly a fungal acne? Fungal acne, its proper name is Malassezia folliculitis, which is also a disease of the pore, very similar to acne. But the stem of the problem is very, very different. In terms of Malassezia, what happens is that we have a yeast that natural leaves on our skin that proliferates far too much and therefore trigger our immune system that will respond. And one of the signs is that you have indeed lesions that are a little bit similar, that are reminiscent of what you get when you have uh, acne, which are those small uh, bumps, but they are very different and the treatment is completely different. So this is not a form of acne, but this is a disease of the pores. So acne is also a disease of the pore, but is due to the clogging of the pore and also of one bacteria that also naturally occurs on the skin, but that proliferates far too much, which is Cutibacterium acneis, and its previous name used to be Purpurni bacterium acneis. But the treatment of those two are completely different. For example, for acne, it is mainly retinoid in the form of retinoic acid, adapalene, but also benzoyl, Peroxide that are going to help to uh, treat acne it could also be due to isotretinoin, also known as uh, Accutane, so something that is very different. But when you have malassezia, what you are going to need is antifungal treatment to control the proliferation of this uh, yeast. So I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and of course subscribe to uh, Gems Welsh. If you are new subscribers, if you want to know a little bit more about me and all the science that is behind skincare, you can also go to my channel at Cyril Laurent. I thank you so, so much for watching. And of course, James, thank you so, so much to have invited me here. And I will see you on my channel. Au revoir. Bye-bye.